there's so much emphasis on how to give feedback and whatnot. My singular focus on that was teaching leaders how to ask for feedback. Ah. Because by virtue of them asking for feedback, they are opening the door and modeling the behavior and modeling that vulnerability. So for me, psychological safety starts with you as my leader. Are you vulnerable? Are you taking risks? Are you admitting mistakes? Are you asking me for feedback so we have an even playing field in our relationship? Or am I always the subordinate and are you always providing feedback to me? Hey friends, I'm Scott Shoot. I'm founder of Changing Work, and we started these Changing Work Live series because we want to highlight leaders that are out there helping to change work from the inside out. We believe that work can be an amazing place. It does not have to be a place that is, whatever, not fun. So today I have with me super genius Jeff Jacobs. Jeff is a senior director of organizational effectiveness at Adobe. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. We need to set a much lower bar than starting off with super genius. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that'll that be for the audience to determine, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you something to uh, rise up and aspire to, right? I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you're joining us live on LinkedIn, feel free to use the comments. It helps us, you know, know that somebody's out there listening. Hey, Robert. Hey, Susie. Good to be with you. All right. Let's get rolling. Jeff, Okay. Senior Director, Organizational Effective. That is a mouthful. Yes. Could you tell us what is organizational <laughs> effectiveness? What does this mean exactly? Yes. So the best way I can describe it is that I sit in the world in between centralized learning and development. So where most of us are familiar with centralized learning and development or talent development organizations, they look out across the organization over all the employees and how do we create development. And then we have our business partners that are assigned business units. I sit in between those folks and I'm like an internal consultant that uh, essentially pretty much 100% of what I do is a tailored engagement. So I work with intact leadership teams. I work with the business partners and the leaders to diagnose how are they doing, how what's their effectiveness, and how do we improve it? Cool. So if you think about it from a business perspective, I'm guessing that this role didn't exist, maybe doesn't even exist now in some companies, but for sure didn't exist 50 years ago. Yeah. So why does a business invest in something like this? Like what is the business hoping to achieve? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And you're absolutely right. Not only did this not this role not exist in the past, it still does not exist at many companies. So I'm very fortunate to have this role at Adobe. It, it's the, the best role I've had in my 30 plus years in, in human resources. So the reason the, the role exists is to help organizations and leadership teams essentially get unstuck. So wherever you are in a model of team effectiveness, Forming, storming, norming, if you like the that particular model, wherever you are, sometimes bringing in those fresh eyes, those internal consultants that ask the questions, that figure out where things are. We help shine a light where people not may not be able to see it. So that way, there's a, there's a huge benefit associated with that. And because we work with teams in these engagements and on ongoing strategies, we can scale to cover a, a fair a fair number of people. I work with 200 leaders and their leadership teams. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of impact we can have. Cool. And, you know, I'm guessing we all have a sense of the themes that are going on at work, but what, what are the themes that you're seeing? Yeah, I get, because of all the change that consistently exists inside and outside of organizations, a lot of my work is around change management, it's around leader and team integration work. Obviously, we're dealing with a lot of back to work activities and you know all of that that goes along with it. I do a lot around communication and conflict resolution and mm -hmm. how do we align around norms of behavior and expectations. And then obviously aligning around strategic planning. A lot of what we get is that people still get confused about okay, I understand the vision, but what does this mean to me? How do I operationalize it? What are you doing? What am I doing? So collaboration is a big theme as well. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, so we're, those are really interesting themes. So we have back to work. We have the company has a vision, but it's not all the way trickling down to alignment with all the employees. We have communications issues because leaders are people too. And sometimes they don't get this right. <laughs> sometimes they're amazing at it. Sometimes they don't get it right. 
Okay, so when this goes well, like yeah. maybe you've seen, oh, I'm sure that you've seen, the differences between this, when company culture or team environment goes well versus it's not going well, like what are the differences that you can point to before and after? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, for me, this is going to be a very potentially simplistic answer. But I, I sometimes measure this in the degree of passive aggressive behavior that we see within the workforce. Huh. Because it has to do with the degree of authenticity, the degree of honesty that that uh, exists. You know, one of the things that strikes me about Adobe, is we have a we have a value called be genuine. And that's not unusual. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies would would have that on their wall and, and such. But that authenticity makes a huge difference. And you can you can tell fairly quickly when you move into a new team, the degree of authenticity that exists, the degree of trust that exists and how much we invest in it. Now, Adobe is a company that has a lot of operational rigor. We focus on delivering for our customers on execution. And it's hard to invest in these things that are perceived as, yes, important, but not urgent. So that degree of trust that we invest in, the safety that fosters innovation and risk taking, that can be very challenging for many organizations. Oh, there's so much in that last thing. So you talk about safety, psychological safety. One of my favorite topics, you've probably seen the research from Google Project Aristotle six, seven, eight years ago, psychological yeah. safety, number one factor in building a high performing team. But let's dig into it a little bit. What does it mean? Like, and, and what's the difference between someone who's not feeling that way and how they perform versus someone who does feel that level of psychological safety and how they perform? Oh, absolutely. So there's, there's a couple pieces in your question. So there is the difference in the performance. And then there's also how do we create that psychological safety? What comes into play there? So the difference is monumental. It has to do with a, a lot, very personal uh, example of that. So Sunday nights, how do you feel about the alarm clock going off the next morning? And that's a measure of psychological safety. That's a that's a, a measure of your emotion, your enthusiasm to be at work. And when you are not feeling safe, you are not questioning the status quo. You are not volunteering ideas. You are not taking risks. You are just have your heads down. And likely you're not collaborating to the degree that you could be as well. Right. And all of those things have exponential impact on our abilities. So that raises the question, so how do you then create psychological safety? There's exactly. a lot of wonderful books out there. There's a lot of wonderful uh, information out there, but I'll, I'll give you my two cents on the, on the topic. For me, psychological safety starts with leadership modeling. So mm. for instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, last year, we had an initiative, a culture of feedback initiative. We wanted to invest in a culture of feedback within the business unit I support. And with the focus on feedback, there's so much emphasis on how to give feedback and whatnot. Mm -hmm. My singular focus on that was teaching leaders how to ask for feedback. Ah. Because by virtue of them asking for feedback, they are opening the door and modeling the behavior and modeling that vulnerability. So for me, psychological safety starts with you, Scott, as my leader. Are you vulnerable? Are you taking risks? Are you admitting mistakes? Are you asking me for feedback so we have an even playing field in our relationship? Or am I always the subordinate and are you always providing feedback to me? So those I are just a couple that. of factors. I love that. I've worked for some amazing people and some of them never asked for feedback once. Yeah. And it just changes our view of them, right? Absolutely. But when we, when we do, as a leader, ask for feedback, we create this level of vulnerability. One of my favorite practices when giving performance reviews, because that's a very vulnerable time as an employee to receive it, of if the manager can also ask, like, all right, you know, let's turn the tables. Like, you tell me, how can I be a better leader for over the next six months or the next year? Yeah. One of the things I think we forget is that our managers, every person we work with only sees one facet of our contributions. So to come forward with feedback, it's almost as though I am coming down with wisdom that cannot be questioned. But really what I'm providing you is a data point for consideration. And you are the only one that has that full spectrum, which is why getting feedback from a number of different people is so critical. Hmm. Cool. Okay, this, th so that 
worth the price of admission. Leaders, <laughs> if you want to build psychological safety, ask for feedback. How about another tip? So the the other thing that comes to mind when we talk about psychological safety is that there was an article that came out a few months ago about value mm-hmm. and the fact that individuals want to be not just valued for their contributions, but valued for who they are as human beings. Hmm. And in some cases, in many cases, our focus is almost entirely on what have you contributed, hmm. as opposed to what we have seen within, especially these last three years, the rise in empathy, the rise in wellness, the rise in even uh, disclosure of needs. It used to be that we, if we were on a video chat and the phone rang or the gardener was here or the dog barked, I'd be humiliated. But now we got kids sitting on our laps and we got all this, this going on. So it's really the degree to which we accept that someone has that, that 360 degrees within their life. One concerning article I saw just this past week was about the concept that we're seeing now in immediate 180 in terms of a lot of the the empathetic work practices that are existing, especially in Silicon Valley, as we're turning around and seeing a lot of the layoffs, not only the layoffs, but the manner in which the layoffs are being conducted is mm. very concerning. So making me feel valued as an individual should not be a difficult thing, but it's also very personal and is a one-by-one situation as opposed to something that scales consistently for the, in the same way across an organization. Sure. So if you were brought in to help a leader get better at this, at Mm -hmm. this idea of helping to see people or have people feel seen, what would you advise them? How would, how do they do that? Yeah, it's a, it's an excellent question. And it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword because one of the things we did during COVID is to combat uh, video fatigue. We used to shorten meetings, but at the same time, what we're also trying to do is encourage people to add more personal connection in these meetings. So not just jumping into the the agenda, but asking people, checking in, how are you doing, asking those follow-up questions, you know, making sure it's it's sincere and yeah. and such. So I think there's there's certainly that aspect to it. But I think the simple nature is that if I'm in a one-on-one with you and I go back, I don't mean to be redundant, but it's how much I believe in this point. If I'm in a one on one with you and I ask you, tell me, um what what uh, observations do you have for me over these past two weeks? What feedback do you have for me over these past two weeks? Yeah. And I'm an individual contributor today. When I had a team, I would frequently end one-on-ones by saying, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how's your engagement today? And whatever they yeah. told me, then I would say, okay, then how do we move it from wherever it is to a 10? Yeah. And that's a two-minute conversation, but it says something about how I value them and what can we do about their situation. That's right. That's right. I love that. Uh, I like that because sometimes we ask, you know, how are you doing? And we get back good and we just leave it alone. Right. Yeah. But instead, if we go further, okay, well, on a scale of one to 10, how are you? Yeah. And not to be pushy, but it's just like, I care. I'm trying to figure out how. And it doesn't take that much time to do these things. That's right. That's right. Uh, Robert has a question and, and friends, uh, I have more questions for Jeff, but I'd love to hear from you in the chat. So if you have questions, go ahead and throw them in there. Robert asks, he, well, he says, I agree that's rare that leaders rarely ask for feedback. Why is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have, I have definitely a point of view on that. And, uh, you know, it goes back, we, we had uh, one of our, our very large scale Adobe events, um, our summit event last year, one of our, our guests was John Donahoe, the CEO of Nike. And he sat down for a coffee chat with our CEO, Shantanu Narayan. And at the end of that coffee chat, Shantanu asked him, you know, so what would you say are your, your top leadership qualities that you think are most important? And I not only loved John's response, but I've also transcribed it and I use it in a number of my different workshops and and sessions with folks. And he says the two qualities that he prizes above all others are authenticity and vulnerability. Mm. Now, authenticity is pretty straightforward. We talk about being genuine and sincere and whatnot, because that's the kind of environment we want. On the vulnerability front, he says, because vulnerability creates connection and connection creates followership. So Mm. why don't people do that? And I was trying to find the study prior to our conversation because it was top of mind for me, but I couldn't track it down. But there was a recent study uh, within the last six months or so that indicated that a significant percentage, upwards of 70% of executives, 
feel as though if they modeled more empathy or vulnerability, they would lose credibility with their followers. Mm. And I think this concept that I believe so strongly in is that there is strength in vulnerability. There is strength in modeling weakness because the only way that we can grow and develop and improve is if we admit we have room to grow and develop and improve. And if we're not doing that, then we're sending that message to our employees that we expect them to not make any mistakes and be perfect. Right. You know, one of the things that I've seen us struggle with at Adobe is with the definition of the word pilot, because pilot is supposed to be a minimum viable project uh, product that you put out there and you iterate on. And sometimes with our attention to detail and our perfectionism, a pilot is just the first perfect attempt at something. <laughs> so we we want to make sure that we're allowing space for for risk taking. Absolutely. I read uh, a really interesting thing the other day about the exact um, best percentage of failure in terms of learning. This was in the context of these scientists were trying to train AI to be smarter. Yeah. And it turns out that r- failure was actually required for AI to learn more. And, you know, in the science, it was something like 16%. The, mm-hmm. the, the appropriate amount of failure was about 16% or one in six times. Mm-hmm. Now think about that in our own lives. Like if, if everything went perfect all the time, we're not really learning a whole lot. Yeah. Or if it went wrong five out of six times, then we're not feeling very great and probably not trying new things. But if we all got a hold of this, hey, one in six is a great amount of failure and celebrated not the failure itself, but what we're learning out of that. Yes. How amazing would that be? And operationalizing those learning sessions. Uh, very true. I've been very fortunate, you know, to work for some great companies, Adobe being one of them. And a prior company I worked with used to regularly do product reviews in which we would we would celebrate the lessons learned from failures. And uh, to make that part of your culture is huge. And what is the story you're telling your employees when you make that part of your operating mechanisms? Beautiful. Human has a question here, said, refreshing to see how this is clearly work, uh, how this is working at Adobe, um, where the leaders value what Jeff has to offer. What strategies do you recommend to employees at companies at companies where the level of awareness may not be present within management? Boy, we could spend several hours on on that question, Human. So I appreciate that. So first off, when I coach an individual, I have to recognize that sometimes you have to be really honest with yourself as to whether the culture of the company you work at is a fit for you and whether or not you're going to be successful there. Because there are companies that say, for instance, you know, we want, uh, we want change agents. We want people to come in and break glass. And then as soon as you start breaking glass, all people look around and say, oh, wait a minute, this person doesn't collaborate well. They don't get along with others. Yeah. So that's my first message is you have to kind of do your own assessment as to whether there is receptivity to this culture change. The second thing is that you have to consider how you are approaching it because your approach needs to be very much in terms of projected solutions, not complaining about the status quo, because you have to be cautious about how you manage your own brand in the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the challenge that a lot of us face. And I know I've received that feedback before of, hey, Jeff, you know, you got to be careful. Don't be so negative. Don't, you know, be the. So I have to take that extra step of not only identifying, okay, what's not working optimally now? And then what suggestions do I have to make a difference here? And who's in a position to make those those uh, changes? So maybe it's a leader, maybe it's a business partner, maybe it's, uh, you know, colleagues on the team, whatever it may be. But it's it's really a case by case situation. But those those are some a couple of initial reactions. Maybe thinking about it another way, if there's folks on the call that are interested in convincing or use this Mm -hmm. word, convincing their internal leadership that this type of work is important. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were to speak to a group of whatever C-level folks about ROI of this type of work, what tact would you take or what direction would you head there? Yeah, it's it's a fantastic question. And, and, you know, I would I would answer with an example. Mm -hmm. A lot of the work I do is because of all the change that exists with within 
are fast moving businesses. We have a lot of leadership changes. And with those leadership changes come stylistic changes. Hmm. And whether I was working for a, um, you know, a hard charging, tough, candid individual, or I worked with the, the caring individual and what's the impact to the bottom line and to the, uh, into the revenue that, uh, that we're, we're dealing with helping accelerate through those stages of change too high performing. We don't have a lot of time. We operate in bite size, monthly, quarterly timeframes. So the faster we can accelerate, the better off we are. And every time we experience a change in a customer, in a deliverable, in a leader, we go back to the beginning of that forming process. And it's only the infrastructure that we have put in place that enables us to speed our acceleration. So if we don't invest in these things that are 100% important, not Mm -hmm. urgent, then we are going to be constantly hitting up against the same walls over and over again. So when I think about ROI, I think I have seen directly how effective some teams are. And I I can tell because I work with them less. So over mm-hmm. time, we will put in a concerted period, you know, concerted effort. And then over time, they they get their momentum. And we are leaders creating leaders because then the leaders become change agents in of themselves when they understand the questions to ask and the process to to go through. Beautiful. I read uh, a couple stats. The first one I think everybody knows is that our relationship with work the single biggest factor in our relationship with work is the relationship that we have with our manager. Of course, yeah. Which makes sense. But here's the thing I didn't know. That relationship with work is the second biggest factor in our overall life satisfaction, yeah. second only to our mental well-being. Yeah. Which means that yeah. the impact that our relationship with our manager has on our overall happiness is extraordinary. Absolutely. So, so Absolutely. to me, when we think about Hey, here's how we can change the world. Making managers, you know, up leveling managers' level of compassion and empathy and quality is uh, is one of those places. We just rolled out a what we're calling the Adobe Leader Experience, which is a, a mandatory training for all of our people managers. And on a quarterly basis, we change the content. And one of the statistics that we shared is that managers have upwards of eighty percent impact on my engagement on any given moment. So eighty wow, percent. 80%. When you think about that kind of, of impact, then you really have to, to have to be incredibly serious about your role as a manager. Yeah. You know, you may be a subject matter expert, but you have to now change how you work as a manager in devoting time to that. I've seen vice presidents who struggle to scale to be senior vice presidents because they still, so at every level, at every milestone, we have new lessons to learn. And I think the challenge is when I've achieved a level of success and I have that big title and I have those stock options and whatever it might be, is it getting harder to hear the feedback? One of the things when I was working with our ops staff, one of the observations I made is you all may think you're approachable, but your titles keep people from essentially holding up a mirror and sharing with you their their observations. So you have to work that much harder to convince them that you are serious and there will not be repercussions for people speaking their mind. Oh, it's such a great point. It happens because of the title, but also happens internally because that leader, everything about their promotion and their path has led them to believe that I'm right. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I am doing this right. And the company has provided. So that is a good point. Well, it goes back and, to our thing about vulnerability. And let's not forget that we have back to back 25 or 30 minute meetings all day. So it's not like we have a lot of free time to provide each other feedback, especially on video. So sure. it's not a hallway conversation. It's a formal, how can I d- get time on your schedule? And maybe three weeks from now, I can give you real time feedback on that exchange we had in this morning's meeting. For sure. Friends, we have about five minutes left in our discussion today. If you have questions for Jeff or myself, please put them in the chat. Um, Jeff, one of the things that I'm really cognizant of now, in in this moment, there seems to be many companies who are cutting budgets, they're cutting mm-hmm. staff. I'm wondering what you're seeing in terms of the level of funding for the work that you do or people development in general. Yeah, yeah. 
You know, I uh, again, I'm I'm very fortunate. Of my 30 years in HR, 20 have been in uh, in high tech, and um, uh, and most of those 20 have been been with uh, two companies in particular that I would prize above uh, above all others. And I think it's uh, those companies that want to invest in what is important, and not just the deliverable on a in a short term uh, in a short term manner. So. For instance, you know, in our last all hands, our CEO put up his hand and said, we're not going to have any layoffs. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that we aren't going to reallocate seats here and there. I mean, we've got 28,000 employees, so we're going to move people around and whatnot, but no 10% across the board, nothing like we, we've seen in those, uh, in those situations. Mm -hmm. So I think the companies that really distinguish themselves are the ones that understand that they have to be very cautious. Now, in a case like Adobe, we have been managing headcount very diligently all along so that we haven't gotten ourselves into a problem. So it's that combination of operational rigor and philosophy. It's the head and the heart about how we approach this. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Uh, Robert asks if retention of talent is a metric that you measure closely at Adobe. Absolutely. We measure retention of talent as it relates to level, as it relates to uh, their um, tenure with the organization. You know, so are we seeing people at one to two years leave at a different clip than those three to five years? We look at it based on region. We looked at it based on business unit. We absolutely look at that. Cool. And going back to ROI, I'm sure it's probably obvious to most of the people on the call, but why does it matter? Why does retention matter? Oh, why does retention matter? Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> retention matters because, first of all, when someone leaves a company, there is something contagious about that. So it's not just one person that's leaving. It's one person who leaves and the grass is always greener and people are attracted to other opportunities. Then, of course, we have the cost of having to cover for that person while we backfill. Then there is the time associated with the backfill. Then there is the training and the, uh, and the upswing of that individual. And then remember what I said about forming, storming, and you know, Norm, and, and the fact that every time a new person comes on, you are reestablishing that team effectiveness. So how do you accelerate that process? So the dysfunction that exists every time one human being leaves our organization is profound. If you just think about to get your job done, how many people do you interact with? And every one of those people has to get used to someone new when your seat is backfilled, even though it may take many months to fill to backfill that seat. Right. Statistics bear this out. It's something like it's a range depending on level and organization, but something the cost to the organization is something somewhere between one half to twice that person's salary on an annual basis. You know, so if somebody's making whatever, $150,000, it could be a $300,000 cost to your company. And that's just the hard cost, not to mention all the emotional costs that you mentioned. There's another piece of this as well. And that is when you have individuals, who, and I, I hate to, to bring this point up, but when you have individuals who are not contributing to the degree they should, and the importance of finding an opportunity for them to be more successful either within your company or helping them make a graceful exit so that you can replace them with a higher performer. We shy away from a lot of those conversations, not at just at Adobe, but uh, that's just human nature. So that's, that's a big piece of the equation as well. For sure. Yeah. I think part of compassionate leadership is also being able to make the hard decisions to take care of that of those underperformers for the rest of the team, for the whole, and even for that person themselves. You know, if the role is not working out, help them either coach them up or find them another role. You know, I'm a big fan of Kim Scott's work around radical candor. And one of the bits of research that uh, that I heard associated with, with that work is that you would think that conventional wisdom would tell you that your biggest fear is being criticized, is being given negative feedback. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the research that I've heard is your biggest fear is you won't be told the truth. Mm. And that people will make judgments and they will put you in a box and they will label you, but not give you the benefit of the, the feedback so that you can change perceptions, you can help develop and grow and become a different person at different stages in your career. Especially challenging if you stay in one place for a long time, then changing some your brand is a real hard thing to do. 
and you rely on that feedback. So that importance of please tell me the truth. Beautiful. I think that's a good place to leave it. You have told us the truth today, Jeff. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate your commitment to this work. I appreciate all the folks who have joined us today. Uh, so thank you. There are a lot of good nuggets in there. And friends, uh, you know, join us uh, next time for the Changing Work Live series. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott.